Have you ever heard about the marshmallow experiment? Or the 10,000 hour rule? Or the Dunning-Kruger effect? Or the Stanford prison experiment? Or hey, maybe willpower fatigue? These are some of the most well-known pieces of research from the social sciences, and they have spawned thousands of TED Talks and books and think pieces, uh, not to mention pieces of content from some of your favorite pop psychology YouTubers. There's just one little problem with all of these pieces of research. None of them are true. Or at the very least, the conclusions that you actually find in them are a lot more complicated than the one sentence summary would lead you to believe. It's shockingly common for major pieces of research that become popular to have a bunch of holes found in them that later invalidates them. And it's a lot less common for popular belief in those pieces of research to be updated. There are a lot of different reasons for this. Uh, one of the big ones, I think, is that it's a lot more fun to create a piece of content like this video about some new and exciting piece of research than it is to go back and offer a retraction for said video. In this video, I'm gonna go through some of that research and I'm gonna let you know what was so problematic about it so that we can hopefully quote less bad science. Let's start with the Dunning-Kruger effect. Here's a graph of it that you've probably seen somewhere on social media. Dunning-Kruger is an effect where people of low ability tend to overestimate how skilled they are. It hypothesizes that most people begin really overconfident. That's the peak of Mount Stupid over there. And then that confidence shrinks rapidly when they realize how complicated something is that they initially thought was really simple. Over time, as your competence grows, your confidence is then regained. So Dunning-Kruger is a really interesting idea, and anecdotally, which for the record means that I'm incredibly biased, but this confirms my pre-existing opinion, so I'm gonna choose to believe that it's true, it aligns with my personal experience. But Dunning-Kruger is a great example of how an idea from the social sciences can become incredibly popular and just turn out to probably be plain wrong. The problem was that there were massive issues with the initial paper, and follow-up research found that its conclusions could be largely attributed to random noise in the modeling. When this noise was accounted for accurately, the researchers found that about half of the people in the study actually assessed their abilities really accurately, and another two-thirds of the remaining half were at least kind of in the ballpark. Only about 6% of participants were really overconfident, and the least skilled people were no more overconfident than the most skilled people. In short, Dunning-Kruger is mostly false. But it sounds kind of fancy, and it confirms a lot of people's pre-existing biases, so you will find it all over social media, even though it's not very hard to fact check at this point. Okay, let's do the backfire effect. The backfire effect is based on a 2010 study, which suggested that correcting somebody's false beliefs could actually cause them to believe in it more strongly. It tested a sample of 130 participants who read a report from 2005 that documented Iraq's lack of weapons of mass destruction immediately prior to the US's invasion of Iraq in 2003. After reading the report, participants were then asked whether or not they agreed with a single really very political statement uh, that was worded a little bit oddly. Here it is. Immediately before the US invasion, Iraq had an active weapons of mass destruction program, the ability to produce those weapons, and large stockpiles of WMDs. But Saddam Hussein was able to hide or destroy these weapons right before US forces arrived. What the study said that it found is that conservatives who had their belief corrected by the 2005 report actually ended up agreeing with that statement more strongly after reading the report than before they read the report. This suggested that learning new information didn't cause those conservatives to actually believe anything differently. In other words, they didn't update their opinion. Now, probably at least a little bit because it painted conservatives in a really bad light, this piece of research was a total pop culture phenomenon. Uh, it led to articles in the New Yorker and many a lengthy think piece was penned. People got really, really into it. The problem was, probably wasn't true. There was a very large follow-up study on 10,000 participants that asked them a series of questions on 52 different subjects, and it found exactly one, one, instance of the backfire effect among all 52 of those questions when they used the first question that was asked in the original study worded just like that. But when they rephrased the question more intuitively 
as following the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, U.S. forces did not find weapons of mass destruction, the effect vanished, and follow-up research has consistently found that fact-checking does cause people to generally update their opinion. So there's some evidence for the backfire effect, but it's under extremely specific conditions, and this is a great example of how the politicization of research can lead to some really inaccurate conclusions. Okay, so how about the marshmallow test? You've probably heard of this one. It was a study on delayed gratification that was conducted by psychologist Walter Michel at Stanford. Children were offered the choice between receiving a small reward right now, like a marshmallow, or if they waited, if they were able to delay their gratification, they could receive two small rewards later. The children who were able to wait for longer periods of time were later found to have better life outcomes, particularly having to do with academics. Now, this research had a wonderful side effect. It led to all kinds of videos of small children having to stare at marshmallows torturously that they aren't supposed to eat, because if they eat them, they must be weak of will, and they're probably doomed for the rest of their lives. They're gonna eat it? It's a plum cake. Plum cake. Well, we're still not gonna get to it. But the problem was that the study only looked at 90 children, and all of those children were taken from the relatively affluent area right around Stanford. A follow-up study that was performed on 900 children from much more diverse backgrounds found that the marshmallow test had a lot more to do with socioeconomic status than it had to do with a children's individual ability to delay gratification. This study found that the ability to delay your gratification was correlated with a very small but greater than zero increase in future outcomes, but those outcomes basically disappeared by the time that the child was 15 years old. But what the new research really found was that a child's ability to delay their gratification was based largely on the social background that the child came from. Children from more affluent, more educated families were generally able to wait longer than those from less advantaged families. And any difference in future performance between the waiters and the non-waiters largely disappeared once researchers controlled for socioeconomic status. If you'd like some more questionable research coming out of Stanford, go Bears! Here's the Stanford Prison Experiment. This was a 1971 incredibly famous study conducted at Stanford where the basement of the psychology building was basically turned into an impromptu prison. It tried to figure out if there were psychological effects associated with becoming either a prisoner or a prison guard. It essentially asked whether being placed in those power roles would impact people's behavior. Would the guards become abusive and aggressive? Would the prisoners become listless and compliant? 24 participants were divided into either guards or prisoners, and the experiment was supposed to run for about two weeks. It was canceled six days in because the guards had become so violent and so aggressive, and several of the prisoners reported having mental health breakdowns of various kinds. It was a real disaster. These days, the Stanford Prison Experiment is quoted all the time. It has become this legendary cultural touchstone, an example of how the uh, darker demons of our nature are lingering just below the surface and could be awoken at any moment merely by the circumstances that we find ourselves in. But the experiment was largely a sham. The guards were actually instructed to be abusive to the prisoners prior to the start of the experiment, and since then many of the prisoners have gone on the record saying that they kind of faked the mental health breakdowns just so they could get out of the darn thing. And this is before we get into the really questionable ethics of essentially abusing a bunch of college students. The methodology of the research has since been called into question by dozens of papers, and no one's been able to replicate the experiment effectively. All right, let's start the lightning round, or we're going to be here all day. Willpower fatigue, or decision fatigue, or the depletion effect, is the finding that the more decisions somebody makes in a day, the worse they get at making future decisions, and particularly, they get a lot less good at self-control. Research from 2015 that re-examined willpower fatigue found very little evidence that the depletion effect is a real phenomenon. And there's some really interesting research from Carol Dweck that suggests that willpower fatigue does exist, 
but only if you believe that willpower is finite. In some cases, people who believe that their willpower is not limited actually perform better after completing a series of challenging tasks. The critical positivity ratio is based on work from Marcio Lusada and Barbara Fredrickson, and it holds that having a 3 to 1 ratio of positive experiences to negative experiences is what determines whether we languish or flourish in life. Their research was published in The American Psychologist, it was cited over 3,000 times, which is a ton for social science research, and that easily understandable 3 to 1 ratio was a absolute hit with pop psychology websites who jammed it into every headline, except there was one big problem. It was wrong. The mathematical model that that whole 3 to 1 ratio was based on, again, wrong. The theory was taken down in the truly brutally titled 2013 research paper, The Complex Dynamics of Wishful Thinking, The Critical Positivity Ratio. The paper highlighted Losada's numerous fundamental conceptual and mathematical errors. Damn. All right, let's finish with a big one. The 10,000 hours rule originally comes from Michael Gladwell's book, Outliers. <laughs> <laughs> where he claims that 10,000 hours is the magic number of greatness. In short, Gladwell's idea is that it takes about 10,000 hours to reach true expertise, whatever that means. This is actually based off of fantastic research that was conducted by Anders Ericsson that was performed on people at an elite music academy. And what Ericsson found was that the difference between the truly transcendent violinists and merely the pretty good ones wasn't based on some abstract idea of talent. Instead, it was based on just how much practice they'd put in over the course of their life. Good professional violinists put in about 4,000 hours of practice, really, really good violinists put in about 8,000, and the truly elite performers registered around 10,000 hours of practice, hence the 10,000 hours rule. So what does this mean? It means that 10,000 hours isn't how long it takes to get good at something. It's not even how long it takes to get great at something. It's how long it takes to get to Olympic levels of performance in an incredibly competitive discipline that many people spend their entire lives trying to master. Gladwell's misrepresentation, witting or not, of Erickson's work, and the subsequent society-wide game of telephone that took place that kind of messed things up even further, pissed him off so much that he devoted a considerable percentage of the rest of his career to taking pot shots at Gladwell. These are famous, important pieces of research, and they are all wrong. And their wrongness is not an isolated incident. It's a symptom of a much larger problem that's facing the social sciences right now. And that problem is known as the replicability crisis. One of the fundamental tenets of the scientific method is that research that is created should be replicable. That means that different researchers should be able to perform the same experiment and come to the same results. The problem is that many of the studies that are published in medicine or the social sciences broadly or psychology in particular have results that can't be replicated. The term can actually be traced back to a 2012 paper, and it's been a huge problem and huge question for the field ever since. One major review published in 2018 attempted to replicate 21 influential pieces of social science research that were published in Nature and Science. These are the two most prestigious general science journals. The study's authors found that of the 21 studies that they looked at, only 13 could be replicated. Even among the studies that were reproduced successfully, the effect size dropped by about 25% which basically just means that the findings weren't nearly as strong as the original research claimed. Among the eight studies that failed, there was essentially no evidence for the findings. And other reviews focused specifically on medical research have estimated that the rate of false discoveries could be as high as around 14 or 15 percent, which is a bit, you know, terrifying. Research in the field of psychology has fallen under particular scrutiny because it's been so hard to replicate it historically. There was this huge project called Many Labs 2, which focused on trying to replicate 28 pieces of classic and contemporary psychology research. These were pieces that were selected due to their enormous influence on the field as a whole. 
and they were only able to replicate 15 of those pieces successfully. Another study attempted to replicate 100 pieces of research and was only able to replicate 39 successfully. So ballparking all of this, about half of the published research in the field of psychology is probably not replicatable. So outside of making everyone really kind of sad about the state of social sciences research, what are the takeaways here? And particularly, can you trust research or maybe just the research that I use in these videos? Can you take any of this seriously at all? This is admittedly a really complicated question and it's really tricky to unpack. What I would say is probably yes, but with some caveats here. So just because some research isn't replicable doesn't mean that all of it isn't replicable. Fortunately, a lot of it is. And the more research we have that shows consistent findings on a subject, the more we can trust it. The one caution that I would give here is to avoid falling into false equivalence. Just because some research can't be replicated doesn't mean that all research is false. And it certainly doesn't mean that a research scientist with a lot of expertise on a subject should have their opinion valued the same way as a random person. Occasionally, there are some really big misses in the research. And learning about all of this has only reinforced my personal belief in healthy skepticism. If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. But maybe even more importantly than that, if it's easy to reduce something to a simple headline, things are probably being left out. So that's it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. It really does help me out. Until next time, thanks for watching.